Good morning. If, good morning. If I could ask everyone to take their seats, please. Good morning. Can I ask everyone to take their seats, please? Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. We do have some very special guests uh, with us this morning that I know we want to introduce to you and get along with our program, so thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks again uh, to APAF for a really lovely evening in, in this room. I know if you're like me, uh, it feels like we've been in this room in this hotel for a while now and not seeing the lovely weather outside, but appreciate all the hard work everyone's putting into this event uh, to make it um, so terrific. Um, just one key piece of housekeeping news. I know um, many of you are catching flights later this afternoon. Uh, we did arrange to have a noon checkout um, so that you can leave your bags in your room and then when we have a break you can go back and grab your bags, maybe bring them into the breakout sessions or uh, have them checked with a uh, bellman up front. So um, hopefully uh, that'll work for you. Um, I'm excited to uh, introduce um, a very special guest from um, Congress who's with us here this morning. Uh, there's a famous country singer who um, often said that, uh, it was often said about her that she was country before country was cool. Um, well, Congressman Bobby Scott was about evidence-based policy and about data-driven criminal justice work before evidence-based practices were cool and uh, criminal justice data-driven policy was cool. So, um, Congressman Scott, you've been a tireless champion um, over the years, both as chairman of the uh, Subcommittee on Crime, then later as the ranking member. Um, and uh, yesterday we heard from Senator Franken. Uh, hopefully later this morning we'll be hearing from Senator Cornyn about the amazing bipartisan support that exists for the uh, Comprehensive Justice and Mental Health Act. You've been the lead sponsor for that in the House with uh, a Congressman, Republican Congressman Collins from Georgia. Can't thank you enough for all that you've done for this issue. I know a particular passion for youth, and I know the people from Virginia and the Richmond area in particular uh, will agree with me. He's just been an extraordinary advocate. Please join me in welcoming Congressman Bobby Scott. Thank you. Well, good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here this morning, and I want to thank the Council of State Governments Justice Center, the National Association of Counties, and the American Psychiatric Association for the critical resources that they provide for policymakers at every level of government. You provide vital and practical advice and evidence-based information to increase public safety and strengthen our communities. I've always enjoyed working with these organizations in my efforts to help reform uh, the nation's criminal justice system and how we can better ensure that imprisoned individuals can successfully re-enter after paying their debt to society. In the criminal justice policy, we have a choice. We can reduce crime and usually save money, or we can play politics. For far, far too long, politicians across the nation have chosen to play politics by enacting so-called tough on crime slogans and sound bites like mandatory minimum sentences and three strikes and you're out, or rhymes like if you do the adult crime, you do the adult time. The 1994 crime bill is back in the news. It contained uh, many of these top polling slogans, but the policy decisions were not based on evidence and research, and there was no data to support those tough on crime policies that would actually uh, to show that they might actually work to improve public safety. As appealing as these slogans and sound bites may have sounded, may, may sound, in fact, research has shown that they have two things in common. One, they fail to reduce crime, and two, they have loaded up our prisons to the point where recent studies have shown that our incarceration rate is actually counterproductive. So many messing up so many families, um, so many people with felony records can't find jobs, wasting so much of the Justice Department budget on prisons rather than effective programs that you're actually adding to crime rather than reducing crime. When we know that um, uh, research also shows that effective strategies to reduce violent crime would include a comprehensive evidence-based approach which includes primary prevention, early intervention, and rehabilitation. 
Uh, that's why I applaud everyone here for supporting and working on the Stepping Up Initiative to reduce the number of individuals with mental, with mental illness in jails. There are an estimated two million people behind bars with serious mental illness, most of whom are low-level, nonviolent offenders. We spend a staggering amount of money to warehouse these individuals rather than providing them the much needed mental health treatment. Research has showed that treatment, in fact, is a more cost-effective way to address mental illness in the criminal justice system than, certainly, than, than simply warehousing the individuals and dealing with the predictable and expensive recidivism. Uh, because of the conclusions of evidence-based research, I've been working with several of my colleagues on this issue, Congressman Doug Collins in Georgia, Richard Nugent from Florida, Jim Sensenbrenner from Wisconsin, and I introduced the Comprehensive Justice and Mental Health Act, which reauthorizes and updates the Successful Mentally Ill Offender Treatment and Crime Reduction Act, or, or MIOCRA. As many of you know, that bill was signed into law by President Bush in 2004, reauthorized in 2008. When first authorized, it offered a new approach to, by investing in state and government initiatives focused on effective, evidence-based approaches to improve interactions of people with mental illnesses in the criminal justice system. The Comprehensive Justice and Mental Health Act will update uh, MIOCRA by better, by better promoting public safety and community health, by facilitating comp uh, collaboration amongst the justice system, criminal justice system, the juvenile justice system, uh, mental health treatment, and substance abuse systems to ensure that those with mental illness actually receive the treatment they need. Our bill authorizes additional funding for mental health courts, crisis intervention teams, corrections-based programs like transitional services, and efforts to help train police officers to better interact with the mentally ill. It also authorizes new investments in veterans treatment courts, which serve veterans who suffer from PTSD, substance abuse, and other mental health conditions. In complementing the efforts of the Stepping Up Initiative, our bill supports state and local efforts to identify people with mental health conditions at each point in the criminal justice system in order to appropriately direct them to mental health services. I'm pleased to report that the House Judiciary Committee favorably reported our bill out of committee this past January, and my hope is that the full House will consider the legislation in coming weeks. Improving how we deal with those with mental illness in our criminal justice system is just one component of our effort to fix our broken criminal justice system. Another recent initiative began in 2013 when uh, Congressman Jim Sensenbrenner and I co-chaired the House Judiciary Committee's Overcriminalization Task Force. For a year and a half, we observed how 32 states reduced incarceration, uh, reduced crime, and saved money spent on prisons. Congressman Sensenbrenner and I wanted to use this once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to use evidence, not emotion, to undo some of the worst damage inflicted by the 1994 Crime Bill and other harmful policies enacted over the last three decades. As a result of the consensus work of the task force, we introduced the Bipartisan Safe Justice Act, which would reform our federal criminal justice system based on facts of who is currently incarcerated, research on what works best, and data gleaned from years of successful state practice. The Safe Justice Act incorporates many of the mental health provisions of the Comprehensive Justice and Mental Health Act and goes even further. It includes uh, investments in primary prevention, evidence-based primary prevention initiatives, such as the Youth Promise Act that the National Association of Counties has endorsed year after year, it has police training, problem-solving courts such as drug courts and mental health courts, significant reductions in mandatory minimums, rehabilitation, not warehousing prisoners, and funding second chance programs so people can re-enter society. All of the programs require evidence and research in order to receive any funding, and all of the initiatives that cost money are funded by savings generated by the reduction in mandatory minimums. We chose research and evidence over political appeals. And while there's momentum for significant reform of our criminal justice system, we must be careful to ensure that we take steps forward to address mass incarceration and mental health issues in our jails and prisons, and that we follow the research and evidence and not choose the backward steps by playing politics. 
and know that the Justice Center, the National Association of Counties, and the American Psychiatric Association, and many other groups represented here today will continue to push policymakers to right, make the right choice and ensure that we're following the best research and evidence. If you are successful, we will achieve a goal that everybody can agree on. We can reduce crime and save money. Thank you for all of your work. Thank you, Congressman Scott, and good morning, everyone. My name is Dr. Rana Parekh, and I'm the director for the Division of Diversity and Health Equity at the American Psychiatric Association. Prior to my role at the APA, I was a practicing child, adolescent, and adult psychiatrist for almost 20 years, including a forensic psychiatry service. So this summit has huge importance to me on multiple levels, and I have the honor of moderating today's plenary. You know, when we're doing this work, it's so easy to get bogged down in the numbers, the data, the politics, and the relationships. But what is really important and is at the heart of these efforts are the individuals and their families who stand to be directly impacted. Often, these individual voices are not heard or included in our decision-making process, but they should be. Individuals living with mental illness and their family members should play a key role in our county planning teams and in your collaborative efforts to reduce the number of people with mental illnesses in jails. They can be strong allies in building goodwill with the broader community, getting positive media attention for your efforts and advertising on strategies for working toward mental health and mental wellness. They also can assist in training criminal justice professionals, providing peer support to individuals and their families in crisis, and identifying the impact your stepping up work is having. This morning's plenary is intended to provide us with the opportunity to hear from individuals who have been directly impacted by the behavioral health and justice systems and to learn how we can make sure their voices, like theirs, are heard in our local efforts. I can tell you firsthand some of my greatest experiences have been li from listening to individuals and their families. I'd like to briefly introduce our two speakers today and then ask them to spend a few minutes talking about why they are here. First, to my immediate left, is Ray Lay. Mr. Lay is an Indiana Certified Recovery Specialist and a Veterans Certified Peer Support Specialist. He's a former active U.S. Marine living and in recovery with dual diagnosis. Mr. Lay has lived in psychiatric institutions and prisons in his life. After some negative interactions with law enforcement, Mr. Lay is now helping to train both law enforcement and correctional officers on mental health issues. He is a member of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, Indiana Board of Directors, and the India, Indiana Balance of State Continuum of Care. He's based in Indianapolis, Indiana. Next to Mr. Lay is Mr. Pete Early. Mr. Early is best known for his nonfiction book entitled Crazy, a father's search through America's Mental Health Madness, which was one of the two finalists for the 2007 Pulitzer Prize, and it describes his struggle to help his adult son after he develops a severe mental illness and is arrested. His book has won numerous awards from the American Psychiatric Association, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, Mental Health America, and even prompted CNN to name him one of the nation's top mental wellness warriors. A former Washington Post reporter, Mr. Early has appeared five times before the US Congress to testify for the need for mental health reform. He has spoken in 48 states and in four foreign countries. He serves on the board of the Corporation of Supportive Housing and participates on a task force that recommended changes to Virginia's involuntary commitment 
laws after the Virginia Tech shootings. He writes regularly for USA Today and the Washington Post about mental health issues. He also writes a weekly blog that is often cited in the media. He's the author of 11 nonfiction books, five novels, including four New York Times bestsellers. So with that, let me ask Ray, why don't you start by telling us a little bit about you and your experiences and why you're here. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ray Lay, and yes, as the doctor just eloquently stated, uh, I am an Indiana Certified Recovery Specialist and a Veterans Administration Certified Peer Support Specialist. I do live with a dual diagnosis, but yet it has been almost 11 years since I was last hospitalized for my uh, mental health issues, and I have almost nine years clean and sober. Uh, thank you, thank you. <clears throat> that wasn't enough for me. I had to put a cherry on the top. I also have almost eight years since I last smoked a cigarette. All right. Uh, and yes, I do have the honor. Just yesterday, boy, what a difference a day makes. Uh, I was helping to train at the Indiana Law Enforcement Academy uh, our future police officers. Um, and today, I do not know what all is encompassed here in this audience, but that's all right. Very much welcome. Hopefully, uh, you are here with a great heart to try to help someone who is maybe in experiencing a mental health uh, episode or, and or crisis. Uh, the other part that I sincerely do would like to speak upon is NAMI and the Corporation for Supportive Housing. I too am a collaborator with the Corporation for Supportive Housing because I was homeless for over 10 years. I am now, I am now housed and have been housed for just about five years, and each and every day, I am constantly trying to figure out something new to give back. Please, let us house people who have mental health issues because you don't know what you might have right there, okay? Uh, and uh, I also, I spent seven years of my life in a prison, three years in a mental institution but I'll still go back. And I've been trying to get back to inside the prisons to help the other people who are in there because the treatment that is offered to them is minimal. My current psychiatrist and I, we spent approximately two and a half years getting my medication cocktail to the point where it is at today. It is no joke. Two or three days will not do it. That's like trying to take a, a, a stick and beat an elephant. It's not going to happen. Please understand that. Um, and with that, I'm going to take a chill pill for a minute. That's <laughs> right. I'm a journalist, so I wrote this down because there's some points I really want to cover well. And so I'm going to refer to my notes. First, though, it's so great to be here. I see so many familiar faces. And so you gave me the microphone for a second, so I'm going to call a few people out, people who are special to me. Fairfax County, where I live, Sheriff Kincaid, <laughs> Chief Rohr, Tisha Diggin, thank you. Gary Ambrose, thank you all for being here. Uh, Eve Stratton, many of you know her, former yes. Chief Justice. Judge Leifman, Leon Evans. Uh, Jackie Lacey, L.A. prosecutor here, thank you for what you're doing. Mary, jo and I always mess up your name, Mary, sorry. Gilliberti for the head of NAMI, so hi guys. I know I missed a lot, but thank you. I'm really thrilled to be here, and I'm really honored, and I don't know if you realize how special this is that you have both a person with lived experience and a parent on the same stage. I have testified five times before Congress. I've never been on a panel with someone with lived experience any of those times. That's a real disgrace because it shows an ignorance that teaches people that persons with mental illness cannot express their own opinion. And as we've just heard, Ray can express it better than anyone else because he's lived it. Parents. <laughs> the parent perspective is also ignored for two different reasons. 
One is, we're seen as being part of the problem. People think in law enforcement, well, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. This is a lousy parent. If he'd raised his kid right, he wouldn't be in trouble. So obviously, I don't want to listen to this person. And doctors hide behind HIPAA. They see the parent is going to be a total pest, so all I have to do is throw up HIPAA, and I'll intimidate him and scare him away. But there's a person in my book that I want to mention who told me an interesting story. He was a person who worked in the jail there. And he said, my sister has had schizophrenia for 25 years. During that time, she's had 15 psychiatrists. She's had over 50 social workers and case managers. And you know what? All of them are gone. Who's here at the end of the day? I am. And I think that is important to remember to partner with parents. I want to tell you briefly about my son, and I want to tell you what we went through. My son first decided when his college food didn't taste well, he called me. I couldn't remember if he was dealing with reality or he was dreaming. He said, Dad, I don't know the difference. So I raced to New York. I took him to a psychiatrist. Now, I want to tell you what that psychiatrist said. He came out and he said, Mr. Early, if you're lucky, your son's using drugs. If you're unlucky, he has a mental illness. And then he said, I'm one of these guys who shoots it straight, no sugar coating. Called my son and I in. He said, listen, you have an incurable disease. It's called bipolar disorder. You will probably never be able to work. You will probably gain 50 to 60 pounds on medications, which you will need. You will probably never get married. You will probably die 25 years before everybody else. And just to add a little sugar on the top of the cake, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, 40% of people like you will end up encountering with law enforcement. Well, we walked out of there, and my son turned to me and he said, ah, that guy's crazy. <laughs> and, and he was defiant. And with defiance came, I'm not going to listen to what they said, and so he stopped taking his medicine. We failed to engage him. Look at what happened the next time. Next time, he was completely off his meds. He was roaming around New York City five days, convinced God to hand him a special mission. I rushed him to an emergency room where they told me, your son's not crazy enough. He hasn't threatened to hurt you or someone else. You bring him back when he tries to kill someone. He slipped out of my house. He broke into a stranger's house. He broke in to take a bubble bath. Police officers arrested him, and he was charged with two felonies, breaking, entering, and discretion of property. Again, we failed to engage him. But let me tell you the last time he was psychotic. This was the fifth time. This time, he was in Fairfax. He got up in the middle of the night. He took off all his clothes. He was walking down the street because when you take off your clothes, you're invisible. And a Fairfax County police officer picked him up. And that police officer had crisis intervention team training. And he treated him with respect. And my son said, I'm not a criminal. Don't handcuff me. The last time I got in this situation, they handcuffed me, and I ran, and they shot me twice with a taser. And he said, I'll use my discretion. He put him in the back seat of that squad car. And then he said, what music do you like? And, of course, my son said, oh, I like rap. And he turned rap on and played it while they went to the hospital. And when they got to Fairfax Hospital and that doctor said, well, being naked and walking down the streets, no sign of dangerous, the officer actually said, and I don't recommend this, he looked at the doctor and he said, well, Dr. Smith, if that's the case, I'm going to drop him off on your front lawn. <laughs> and all of a sudden, my son was admitted. And then he got a case manager. And that case manager said to him, why don't you take your medication? Do you know my son's seven psychiatrists, only two have bothered to learn anything except his name and his symptoms? And that's because they're taught that they're going to get paid for 15 minutes. It's a biological illness, and they're diagnosticians who just are going to stick a pill in your mouth and send you out the door. But treating a mental illness requires treating a patient as a person, not just as that. And then, look, I live in Fairfax County. I had room in my house, but she said to him, you need to live on, you're 30 years old. You shouldn't live with your father. She got him into supportive housing, two guys with schizophrenia. And then she said to him, what do you want to do with your life? And he said, what can I do? I have a mental illness. And she said, knock it off. Control the illness. Don't let it control you. I got just the program for you if you want to help people. And she got him into peer-to-peer. -peer. And she got him to be a certified peer counselor. And let me tell you a little something about my son. I'm not supposed to share all this, but he tells me some things. A guy, schizophrenia, his parents' basement, afraid to come out. My son got to know him. He got him out. 
went to McDonald's, not the best choice, but he got him out. Now, that's not a big deal unless that's your son. Today, my son works on a Fairfax County jail diversion team. He lives on his own, pays taxes, has to work two jobs because he's not paid enough as a peer-to-peer. -peer. He's been stable for seven years. So don't tell me people can't get better. Of course, I ignored all this, but I want to leave you with four points that I do want to mention. The first one is, never forget that the person who is psychotic and standing before you who may be threatening you is sick. My son felt tremendous guilt after he realized he'd broken into a stranger's house to take a bubble bath. That wasn't him. That was his illness. Never try to talk someone out of their delusions. I'm telling you, if we all thought... If we were convinced, if our mind was telling us, if we left this room, we'd all die, we'd all be sitting here getting to know each other a lot better. You can't argue with the delusion. Third, no one knows the individual better than the person who is their relative and their parent. Not all parents are great, but you should listen to what they have to say. They have the most invested if they love the person who they're dealing with. And finally, next time, this isn't rocket science, folks. The next time you deal with someone with a mental illness, I'll give you the golden rule. Look at them as if they were a family member. How would they want to be treated, and how would you want to treat them? You know, when my son was his sickest, he still knew if people were respecting him, he still knew if people cared about him, and I found that phenomenal. So thank you very much. I appreciate being here. Thank you both. Uh, you both touched on something that's really important, and that's the role of families and individuals being part of all of our endeavors. How does one, how do people in this room, how do we identify and recruit people like you to be on community task force or to be part of conferences like this? Wow. I was recruited from a friend of mine, he actually heard me listen, heard, listened to me talk one particular day, and uh, he came after me. And we're still friends today, and um, I'm glad he did, okay. because I have had the opportunity to work with a lot of other people uh, and help a lot of people to get into, mm. get into treatment and stay in treatment. It's not that difficult. Uh, this is what always amazes me when the fact that Congress doesn't call someone who has a mental illness. National Alliance on Mental Illness, which I'm a lifetime member of, has in our own voices people with mental illness talking about it. Mental Health America has access to people who are happy to talk about it. I, and the, there's something that I've discovered when I go around and give speeches. When you hear someone like Ray, you're touched. I, I, you know, y y you just, but you don't think you're going to end up with a mental illness. Hmm. You don't think you're going to end up in jail. You don't think you're going to be homeless like the guy off of the McPherson Square subway stop lane. You don't believe that. So you empathize with Ray. You need to get a parent or family member there because, by God, it could be you. It happened to me. I worked at the Washington Post. I had this big career, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't discriminate. Does not and so discriminate. that is what you, I think it sends a different message, too, when you have a family member there. And so I also think if you want to do advocacy, listen, um, you've got to find a person who has someone in their family with a mental illness. Find that county commissioner. I mean, you guys know this. Find that supervisor. You've got to find them and connect because they will understand intrinsically what you are going through because they go through it. I spoke to 150 judges, Redmond, Oregon. Four of them had their kids in jails and prisons. And those are judges. So look for that link and try to get those people hooked in. And then finally, and then I'll shut up here, you're not going to win them over with morals. <laughs> you're not going to win them over by telling them to do the right thing. I'm sorry. I've been in Washington a long time. I, like, I may be insulting. Politicians care about two things, votes and money. You have to go at them. We're fortunate stepping up campaign really shows it. You have to go to them and say, like they did in Bear County, Texas, we're saving $3 million a year. 
by getting people and we're helping them. You know, people with mental illness, listen to Judge Leifman, 87% recidivism rate. They're wasting your money. That's what you guys are here for. That's how you get the politicians to finally listen. Because going in and just saying, look, my kid has a mental illness and it really sucks, isn't gonna do it. Unfortunately, we only have a few more minutes, but I wanted to ask each of you, there are many people in this room across the country and officials, if there is one thing that you would recommend that we change about the behavioral health system or criminal justice system in this country, what would it be? How do you treat a person with a mental illness like a person? <laughs> Bottom line. I'm gonna get more specific in the sense that in, in the last 10 years that I've been crossing the country, the biggest challenge I see is getting people to understand that mental health issues are a community issue. They're not a law enforcement issue. They're not a criminal justice issue. You gotta have housing, you have to have transportation, you have to have veterans, you have to have drug and, and uh, alcohol treatment programs. You have to do wraparound services. And I think we make a mistake. This is a, stepping up is the first step, but there's more steps to take. Housing is so, so essential. And we're not there yet. Uh, and I think it's unfair, you know, I, I'll tell one little thing I give from my speech. You know, if I had a, a broken arm, I wouldn't call the police department. If I needed heart surgery, I wouldn't call the sheriff. If I had nasty hemorrhoids, I wouldn't call a judge. So why do we expect, <laughs> why do we expect the police, sheriff, and judges to solve what is a community problem? And that, to me, is that awareness. Everywhere I've gone where they've done things like Bear County, Texas, or Judge Lifen. It's been a community effort. Wonderful. Well, I hope the two of you will be here a little bit longer for questions, but please help me thank both Mr. Pete Early and Mr. Ray Lay. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Their stories are incredibly inspirational, and I think it just highlights again the importance of giving individuals voices family members' voices, and communities. Um, I'm positive that there is no one in this room that does not know somebody with a mental illness. Um, and I believe the courage that these two men displayed this morning will help us and encourage us to find other people like them who can share their stories. Um, through all of this, I think the conversation, this important conversation about mental health will continue. Um, stigma is a really big issue with mental illness early intervention, prevention, how we work with the criminal justice system, incredibly important. And regardless of our professions, that it's really critical that we listen to each other and we work together collaboratively. Last evening at the incredible Apex uh, dinner and award ceremony, we had the opportunity to hear from Ms. Koki Roberts and the American Psychiatric Association's president, Dr. Renee Binder. They both talked about the importance of advocacy and Dr. Binder talked about a call to action. We're hoping that this plenary motivates you to help move the needle. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Brian Deloge. I am the incoming president of the National Association of Counties, and let me tell you how excited we are to be part of the process here and be part of the program and be partners with everybody in the room. I think in the last 24 hours, I've seen a lot of sparks flying around the room, a lot of great things happening, and one of the partners in the mix is the White House. So we are very excited to introduce our special guest with us today. Valerie Jarrett is a senior advisor to the president, overseeing the White House Offices of Public Engagement, Intergovernmental Affairs, Chair of the White House Council on Women and Girls. Ms. Jarrett is familiar with inner workings of local government, previously serving as the Deputy Chief of Staff for Chicago Mayor Richard Daley. Uh, Ms. Jarrett has also been one of the main drivers behind the White House's push for criminal justice reform, particularly targeting mental illness and incarceration as one of her key issues. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Valerie Jarrett. Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Washington, my home away from home. 
Uh, thank you, Commissioner Deloge, for your leadership of NACO. You've been a terrific partner on a range of issues that are important to the American people, and we have enjoyed working with you uh, and the organization over the last uh, seven plus years on a range of issues, including criminal justice reform. So thank you. How about a shout out for his leadership, right? Thank you. I also want to thank the Council of State Government Justice Center and the American Psychiatric Association Foundation. That's a mouthful. And I just had an opportunity to meet the president for your important efforts in the topic that we're going to be discussing today. Everyone who's come together on this has uh, made productive contributions to ways of improving our country and our health for everyone and to keep it safer as well, which I'll get to in a minute. We appreciate your hard work and your commitment to reducing the number of people with mental illnesses who fall prey to our criminal justice system each and every day. Last Saturday, I had um, occasion to visit, uh, visit Wichita. Has anyone been to Wichita? It's not so easy to get to from here, let me tell you, but it was well worth my trip. I visited a diversion program run by a woman who had been a drug addict, had been in prison, and when she sat in her prison cell, she said, if I ever get out of here, I'm gonna do something to help all the young women in Wichita who fall victim to the sexual abuse to prison pipeline, the school to prison pipeline where they're expelled and suspended from school and end up on the street. And I'm gonna do everything I can do to help them. And I met a young woman there who I will not forget. She was from Haiti. When she arrived in the United States, her parents abandoned her. She was adopted not once, but twice. And now she lives in a home, uh, a shelter for young girls. She's a junior in high school, and she's one of the lucky ones. Because this incredible program provided her with a safety net, counseling, intervention, self-esteem counseling, allowing her to get her life back on track. And if it wasn't for this program, I know exactly where she would have ended up. The statistics I want to give you are pretty extraordinary, and many of you are familiar with the ones that impact your specific counties and states. We spend $80 billion a year on incarceration. Even in Washington, that's a big, big number. We have 5% of the world's population, yet we have 25% of the world's prisoners. One in three working age adults has a criminal record. That's 70 million Americans. There are 2.2 million people behind bars currently. The number of women who are incarcerated has gone up by 400% over the last 30 years. 11 million Americans are in our county jails, a statistic I know you are very well aware of. They stay on average 23 days, yet only 5% are ultimately convicted and sent to prison. Those numbers are unsustainable. But it's not the numbers that cause me the sleepless, sleepless nights. It's the human consequences of our inhumane system. And we know what to do. There is evidence that proves what the solutions are. That's why President Obama and his administration are taking a hard look at reforming our criminal justice system in four, three different buckets. The community, the courtroom, and the cell block. So in the community, our effort is to make sure that every young child gets a fair chance. Every young child has an opportunity to go to school, get a great education, be on a path to being a responsible adult. And it begins with initiatives like early childhood education, the President's My Brother's Keeper initiative that he launched a couple of years ago to help boys and young men of color. We're investing in research that uh, gives us a roadmap to how, for how to help girls and young women of color both who predominantly end up in the criminal justice system in disproportionate numbers. So we are focusing on the community first. Next, we're focusing on the courtroom. We know, and I'll talk a little bit more in a minute about important legislation that is currently being considered before Congress, but we know that our prisons are clogged with people who have been convicted for nonviolent drug offenses. So we want to reduce those mandatory minimums. 
we want to make sure the people, the judges, have the discretion that they need. I have met countless judges who tell me that they look at these heartbreaking cases where they know a person needs to be in a treatment program. They know that they were simply unloved and need somebody to put them under their wing and provide them the right path, and yet their hands are tied and they're forced to sentence people to unbelievable sentences and lose their opportunity to be productive Americans. And then there's the cell block. When people are incarcerated, we have to provide them with the job training they need, the drug treatment they need, the social services that they need, so that when they leave prison, they can re-enter society and hit the ground running. Right now, we aren't doing that nearly enough, and we need the resources available that we could invest in people while they're incarcerated. And then when they leave prison, and 600,000 people a year leave prison, we've got to make sure that they have a job. Just last week, the president announced a fair chance uh, business pledge where we have businesses large and small from Coke Industries to Microsoft to Google to Uber, small businesses right here in D.C. like Busboys and Poet, all who um, have committed to take a hard look at people who've been incarcerated to give them a chance. The best way of breaking our cycle of recidivism is to make sure people get the help that they need and that they have a job when they leave prison. I believe, and we all believe, I know, that we are at a unique moment here in our country. The spotlight is on this issue. There are evidence-based programs all across the country that are working, and we have a bipartisan um, effort going on in Congress that I believe will lead to comprehensive criminal justice reform and a bill on the president's desk. You'll be hearing from Senator Cornyn in a minute. He has been a leader on this effort, a co-sponsor of the bill that passed the Senate Judiciary Committee. It is a good bill. It is a bill that President Obama will sign. And so we're going to continue to work with the Senate and the House with the hopes of moving a bill to the President's desk in short order. The bill would reduce mandatory minimums. It would provide prisoners with the tools that they need to turn their lives around. It would give nonviolent juvenile offenders the second chance that they have earned because we know young people can screw up. They can do that, and we have owe it to them to give them that second chance. And it would reduce overly long sentences for the non-drug, nonviolent drug offenders, which would free up the additional resources that we know we need to invest back in improving their lives, improving public safety, and including um, enhancing re-entry programs as they enter society, programs that include treatment for mental illness and addiction. The president believes that this legislation makes us safer, will make our communities safer, make our communities healthier, and make the United States a stronger country. Next week is National Reentry Week, and you'll be hearing more from the administration there, but we want to highlight the programs that work. We want to put a showcase the best practices so that folks all around the country can learn a lot of what we've learned from many of you in this room. And we have prioritized these efforts and will continue to do so. That's why the Affordable Care Act puts mental health on parity with physical health care and invests. <laughs> it seems so obvious to all of us in this room. It invests in substance abuse treatment and expands Medicaid. We've also invested in justice mental health collaboration grants that help communities coordinate between criminal justice systems, and behavioral health care to better serve people with mental health needs in the system. We, invest, we have invested in programs such as law enforcement assistance diversion, where individuals with mental health and addiction problems can receive treatment instead of jail. The President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing also recommends expanded crisis intervention training because more and more of our excellent first responders who are out on the front line every day are being sent into situations where they have to deal with individuals in mental crisis and they need resources and help to do so. We're working on a new initiative in partnership with many of you in this room using data to find people who are recycling through not just our jails but our emergency rooms, our homeless shelters and many other services. You know firsthand that the cost to counties of our current system is unsustainable, not to mention the impact on the individuals, their families, and our society. And we're not safer when Americans with mental illness are treated as dangerous criminals. 
when it's treatment and support they actually need. We must treat problems such as mental illness and addiction as a public health issue, not a criminal issue. Our data-driven justice initiative is building from the innovations pioneered by many of the counties around this room by taking a deeper look at who is more likely to be picked up by the system and importantly, why. It builds on the efforts such as Miami-Dade counties, uh, which uses data and has identified the 97 highest utilizers of jail, emergency rooms, psychiatric facilities, and hospitals. These 97 people cost the county $16 million over four years. 97 people. Judge Steve Leifman, where are you, Steve? I saw you. I met you when I came in. He works across the police, hospitals, courts, et cetera, to divert people in mental health crisis away from the criminal justice system before they're arrested, and he links them to care in the community. This is a judge whose job it is to oversee his courtroom, but he cares enough to intervene early and try to help people before they're ever caught up in the system. Since Miami-Dade started their program, their jail population has dropped from 7,800 to 4,400. That's 7,800 to 4,400, and they were able to close an entire jail facility, saving $12 million a year. That's results. <laughs> Miami-Dade and so many of you have helped drive our data-driven initiative, and we appreciate your efforts in, in stepping up. So in conclusion, we know what to do to make our community safer. We know what to do to make Americans healthier. We know what kind of mental health services work. And all we need is the cooperation of everyone in this room and folks all across our country to make sure that we're giving people the treatment they deserve. If we do that, I believe we will move towards our more perfect union. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much, Valerie Jarrett. How thrilling to have the president's top advisor with us talking about this issue and then to be able to introduce the number two leader in the United States Senate, uh, the majority whip, uh, Senator John Cornyn. You heard yesterday from the uh, sheriff in Bear County, Texas. Uh, you heard from a number of other Texas officials and they will be quick to tell you there is no one uh, here in Washington, D.C. who's a stronger advocate for local law enforcement and public safety than U.S. Senator John Cornyn. What you'll also hear from people in Texas, uh, from mental health advocates, family members, and consumers, that there is no stronger advocate for mental health than Senator John Cornyn. Please join me in welcoming Senator John Cornyn. Well, good morning. It's good to be here with all of you today. A few. Uh, Months ago, I was at a meeting somewhat like this at a large hotel in Washington, D.C., and a friend of mine asked me, how would you like to meet the largest mental health provider in the country? And that was my friend, uh, Sheriff Parmelo from Bear County, Texas, who introduced me to the sheriff of Los Angeles County. That made a big impression on me because I, for one, did not realize that our criminal justice system had become the provider of, uh, by default of mental health services to the extent it does provide mental health services and really uh, brought the point home to me like nothing else that I have uh, experienced. But I also have to say, uh, you know, Washington DC is a strange place for a lot of reasons. I always tell my friends from Texas, I said, uh, it's a lot like Disneyland. You know, it's a fascinating place, but it's not real. <laughs> but a lot of really important stuff gets decided up here, and so, uh, and this is one of them, one of those issues. I just have to tell you another quick anecdote. One of my friends in, uh, in the Senate said, did you know that one out of every four persons in America is affected by some sort of mental illness? 
and I was shocked at the number, and I said, well, there are 100 members of the United States Senate. <laughs> you do the math. Surely that's, I hope that's exaggerated. But I also have to give um, a couple other um, shout outs to people who've been, been a big influence on me. And that's uh, Pete Early uh, right here. Pete. <laughs> now I heard what Pete said about politicians. <laughs> and he's not, in, he's not entirely wrong. Politicians do have to worry about who pays the bills and how that money is allocated. And one of the biggest challenges we have is that the payers are different. I mean, you have different payers for Medicaid, you have different payers at the county level in the criminal justice system, then you have the public health system, and somehow you have all these different payers, and if we could find some way to coordinate both the services and who pays for them in a sensible way, I think we could do, uh, we could make a lot of progress. The last thing I want to say, say before I get into the substance of, um, of what I wanted to talk to you about <clears throat> is I'm happy to work with President Obama on issues that we agree on. And as a Republican, it might not surprise you that we don't agree on everything. There are things we disagree on. My hope is they are disagreements based on principle and good faith. And then when we find things where we can come together and work on, that's how we actually get things done. And the longer I've been in Washington, working in Washington on behalf of my state, sometimes I call it that forward operating base in hostile territory. Um, but as longer I'm here, the more I've realized that really what it's all about is getting things done and being effective. And uh, we need to look at ways we can work together no matter what our differing ideologies or political philosophies happen to be. And this is an area where we can do that. <laughs> Last thing I want to say uh, sort of in a preliminary way is uh, I just want to tell you what a big influence my friends and constituents in Bear County, Texas have been. Um, my San Antonio, I'm an Air Force brat. Uh, my dad served 31 years in the uh, Air Force, and we landed in San Antonio, Texas when I was in ninth grade. But I grew up there, went to college there, law school, practiced law. That's where I first got elected uh, as a district judge way back when. But I couldn't be more proud of the pioneering work that Bear County is doing in this very area. And it is because of their example that it inspired me to do what I can do in the United States Senate to try to scale up this great model for delivery of mental health services, segregating the people who are the criminals who, uh, who aren't going to be helped by medication or by counseling from those who can be and will be in a sensible sort of way. So one area where I do find myself differing from, uh, from the administration is I don't believe in social experimentation at the national level. I just don't believe it because we're such a big, diverse country. It's just impossible, in my opinion, to try to initiate ideas at the national level and say, we're going to do this for all 320 million Americans. I just don't believe it works. And I could point to some evidence of that, but I'm not. But I do believe we can take successful models at the local and the state level, and we can scale those up at the national level and benefit the entire country. In the criminal justice reform area, we've had very successful reforms in the state of Texas back in 2007. I know at the time it was pretty controversial. Everybody thought, you know, Texans are always tough on crime, right? And nobody ever got elected to public office by suggesting you be anything other than tough on crime. But people finally realized, and I agree with this part of what Pete was alluding to, people finally realized that you can't build your way out of the criminal justice problem. You just can't do it. And we also realized another reality that people will ultimately, most people who go to prison, will ultimately get out of prison. This point was brought home to me when I visited a penitentiary in East Texas a few months back with a guy who was teaching the shop class. He said, I have people here who can't even read a ruler. 
I can't even read a yardstick. Almost hard to believe, but that's what he said. And so how ill-prepared will those people be to go back out into society where they already have two strikes against them? If you have a felony record, it's going to be really hard to get a job. There are a lot of great programs that are trying to address that. And secondly, and I didn't really fully appreciate this until recently, it's pretty hard to find a place to live. And how, if you can't find a, get a job and you have no place to live, how in the world are you going to transition back into productive society? So those are, I think, two of the biggest challenges in that area. But we're here talking primarily about the mental health challenge. And so based on the inspiration given to me by my friends in Bear County, based on people like Pete Early, who brought this home in such a personal and dramatic way in his book, Crazy, and he testified, of course, recently in a hearing we had before the Senate Judiciary Committee, I introduced a piece of legislation called the Mental Health and Safe Communities Act. This provides for the 1% that the federal government currently spends in state and local law enforcement programs on mental illness, it would grow that percentage. And indeed, I can't imagine anyone arguing we ought to keep it at 1% of what we spend given the challenge to our criminal justice system and to our local communities. But it would increase funding at this federal level for law enforcement training and for local officials so they can learn how to correctly deal with mentally ill offenders and prevent violence that would be harm not only to the individual but also to the law enforcement agencies. It would increase uh, treatment-based response during incarceration and post-release custody through pretrial screening and assessment programs. And it would also, and I think this is really an important part, it's, it seems so small, but as Pete taught me, you know, when we deinstitutionalize the mentally ill in this country, we perhaps assumed that there would be some sort of safety net that would protect them and deal with their challenges, but it doesn't exist by and large. And so that's why mentally ill people are living on our streets or crowding our emergency rooms or occupying our jail cells. So why not give families additional tools through outpatient, court-ordered treatment to help their loved ones? Because right now, I'm afraid too many people with mentally ill children and loved ones have no real alternatives but to see them living, living on the streets, committing petty crimes, ending up in our jails, or getting sicker and sicker and sicker and becoming a danger not only to themselves but also others. And to the point that was made earlier, we could save money for the taxpayers. I don't think that's a bad thing. I think trying to be, uh, trying to make sure that tax dollars are spent efficiently and, and actually have an impact is a good thing. But ultimately, what we need to do is focus on public safety. I know sometimes you hear people talk about a lot of different things in this context, but to me, it's all about public safety. And it's about safety for the individual who suffers from mental illness and the communities that they live in. And my hope is by working together, we can actually take the example that we've seen in communities across the country, and I know Bear County is not the only one, and we can scale it up and provide those benefits through increased grant funding at the national level. Again, I'm not necessarily talking about increasing the overall amount of money that the federal government spends. I think it's about $200 million a year, but with only 1% of that spent to deal with mental health issues, surely we can and we must do better. So I just want to say by working with the uh, Stepping Up Initiative and the National Association of Counties, the Council of State Governments, Justice Center, and the American Psychiatric Foundation, all of us working together, I think we can do better, make our communities safer, and make our communities more humane, where people who have mental health challenges can get the help they need without ending up being warehoused in our criminal justice system. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Cornyn, and wow, right? I mean, what better demonstration for the incredible support